Okay, if those are the goals, then how are we going to achieve them? Here are the major institutions that comprise a participatory economy or this proposal or this vision. We're going to have social ownership. We're not going to have private ownership of the means of production. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't own your shoes or your socks or your iPhone. It just means that anything that we need to produce goods and services is not owned by private individuals. It is owned by all of us. Now, at some point in discussion, maybe we'll get into, well, is that state ownership? Is, I mean, is social ownership different from state ownership, different from private ownership? And the truth of the matter is, and you're going to, and somebody's going to sort of at some point want to know, well, do those workers' councils, do they own the machines in their, in their factory buildings? And we'll talk about that. My own honest feeling is that the concept of ownership is a very appropriate concept when you're talking about private enterprise economies and Soviet economies. It really isn't a concept that works when you're talking about the kind of alternative to capitalism that I think is more desirable. Um, ownership, ownership basically says when you own something, you can do anything you want with it, including selling it to somebody else. And what we're going to end up talking about is productive resources of any kind, which you might even call the commons. If it's natural resources, it's part of the natural commons. What if it's technology and know-how? Well, that's part of what we need to produce things. Well, that's the knowledge commons. What if it's machinery and buildings? Well, that's what traditionally socialists thought of as the means of production. And that's part of the productive commons. What, if, what, if, what about this stuff that... that um, that mainstream economists called human capital. Well, I'm going to argue that that's also part of the productive commons. All of that is something that every generation basically inherits as a gift from the previous generations. The state of the natural environment is what we inherit as a gift collectively. The knowledge about how to do things, we inherit collectively from all who went before us. All of that in all of that is going to be treated as belonging to everybody and nobody in a participatory economy. So when I say social ownership, I actually mean something that I mean that to simple to, to, to represent something that's a little more complicated and perhaps even more broad. And then the question becomes how do you distribute user rights over the collective commons that, we, that belongs to all of us? You want to distribute the user rights so that whoever can make best use of the commons is allocated the right to do so and use them. And you want to be sure that the benefits from using the collective commons, everyone deserves to benefit equally from their use. So you need to distinguish between user rights of the commons and who benefits from the commons. And the whole concept of did somebody own something sort of, you'll see, actually kind of disappears in a participatory economy. But loosely speaking, since everybody wants to know, well, is it a private ownership economy? or, Well, it's a social ownership. It's not state ownership. It's not private ownership. We have democratic worker and consumer councils. <coughs> In every workplace, everybody who works there, whether, they work, whether they've been working there for 15 years, 10 years, or they were just hired in a month ago. Oh, could you have provisional things? Yes, we could have provisional things. But basically, no matter how long you've been someplace, if you're working there, then you're a member of the Worker Council. Every member of the Worker Council has one vote. And those Worker Councils are sovereign over the workplace. Stockholders of private corporations basically have the power to make any decision they wish about what's produced and how it's produced. The Workers' Council has that power. 
Now, stockholders usually hire managers to go ahead and run things for them, and every once in a while, fire the manager. Well, you could say that the workers' council could do that if they want to. In a minute, we're going to say, boy, we should have think that would be a bad idea, and they wouldn't want to do a thing like that. But basically, the workers' council is sovereign over the workplace the same way that stockholders are sovereign over the, the decision-making process of privately owned or privately held corporations. Um, there's also consumer councils, <laughs> neighborhoods of people, maybe 1,000 people, 2,000 people in a neighborhood would form something called a consumer council where also, if you're a member of that council, you have one vote just like everybody else. We'll talk about what that council does in a minute. So you have social ownership, democratic worker councils and consumer councils, jobs, balance for empowerment and desirability. Here's the problem. We've just given everybody in the worker council one vote. Formally, they all have equal right and opportunity. They, they formally have equal rights to participate in decision making in the enterprise. But what if some of the people in that enterprise sweep floors all day, every day, week after week, year after year? And other people in that enterprise they start at 9 in the morning, they go to a meeting about this, then they go to another meeting about, well, let's see, should we change our product lines? Should we do things differently? Should we buy new machinery? So you have some people going to meetings every day. That's their job. Those are the tasks that they're assigned. And other people are just sweeping floors or doing things that in no way empower them to understand what are the issues that the enterprise faces that require decisions. If that's the way you've organized jobs, if you've combined tasks so that some people's jobs are much more empowering than other people's jobs are, then what will inevitably happen is that the formally equal right to participate in decision making in the workplace will essentially become a sham. It will erode over time. And one of my readings of dozens of sociological dissertations that were written about the history of worker self-management in Yugoslavia is that's precisely what happened. So <clears throat> the idea is that it, it would be very wise for workplaces to think very seriously about reorganizing tasks in the workplace, combining them into jobs, so that every job has empowering tasks as well as tasks that are less empowering. And to some extent, why not think... Why should some people's work lives be so much more unpleasant than other people's? Why should they be balanced for desirability? Now, well, I'm going to do the next one, and then I'll come back to, well, who makes these decisions? Who, who actually balances these things? And who enforces this or doesn't enforce this? So we'll come back to that in a second. Compensation. <laughs> Well, we had our sort of thinking about what would be a fair way to compensate people. Um, who's going to do it? Our proposal is that workplaces would have to, the workers' council, they themselves, would have to make decisions about have some of us worked harder and made greater sacrifices than others. So we call this sort of setting up a, a a remuneration committee. Actually, that's Mike's word, not mine. That's, that's, but an effort rating committee where effort is interpreted as, in some way, you made a greater sacrifice than somebody else did. So our suggestion is that <clears throat> workplaces are going to need to essentially assign effort ratings to themselves. Um, and that is going to become the basis for any differential consumption rights when people are consuming in their through their neighborhood consumption councils. So that's what compensation is going to be based on effort. The need part, and this is an interesting question, and this is a huge debate with the anarchists. Um, <clears throat> the proposal is that clearly we want to compensate people for differential effort and sacrifice. But there are clearly situations where some people just have greater needs than other people. Um, the example we've given traditionally is, well, what if you had somebody who worked for 15 years 
and their effort and sacrifices were perfectly adequate, just average, and they contracted AIDS. And in the early, in, in the 1980s in the United States at one point, the actual cost to society of a humane treatment for an AIDS victim, for, for an AIDS victim was roughly a million dollars. Well, if compensation was purely according to effort and sacrifice, you would have to deny that AIDS victim um, you know, a humane medical treatment. Well, that's crazy. Um, the question becomes, where does that get taken into account? And we're going to say, well, you also have another situation when you have compensation. Not everybody's working. So for those who are working, then we're going to take care of the part of their compensation by it's going to be based on effort and sacrifice as judged by their coworkers um, in whatever process those coworkers want to set up to do that. Um, but what about people who are too young to work, going to school? What about people who are retired? What about people who are disabled? Well, you clearly have to assign compensation rights to all peoples in those categories, and <clears throat> you're going to have to have rules to do that. Now, in some sense, those rules aren't that different from the kinds of things that we're familiar with. At what age do people retire? At what level of consumption? How high is my Social Security benefit if I'm in the United States? Well, clearly all those things have to be decided the same way that they're just, They have to be decided just as they're decided now, and our proposal is that all that has to be done in a democratic way, probably democratically through the political process if you want to think of, that, think of it that way. But then there are sometimes special needs that are not you were disabled, you applied, you qualified, or you're retired, um, or you're young and you're still in school. Um, and our proposal is not that workers in the workplace need to worry about taking that into account when they're making their effort or, or sacrifice um, sort of ratings or, or judgments. Our proposal is that's a great place. Have the neighborhood consumption councils do that. That people can apply through their neighborhood consumption councils and say, look, here's my effort rating. Here's our disability, or here's our, but we've had this situation and we have special needs. And you're going to have, the, I think, the, a perfectly appropriate place for having that kind of thing taken into account so that sometimes compensation is based on need. It would be based on need as applied for through your neighborhood council and as granted by the neighborhood council. Okay. The final sort of major institutional piece of architecture is something called a participatory planning procedure. And I'm going to talk a little greater length about that. History and origins. Hey, I'll cut to the quick here. <clears throat> is, this, is there any example in actual history where somebody's actually done an economy this way? No. Next slide. That's not entirely true. It's been tried here. It's been tried there. Um, it's tried in little be bits and pieces in all sorts of places. And I think if you take a careful look of where people have tried things like this or parts of this, there's a lot of evidence that works perfectly well. And on the subject of, well, was there any place where a, a big economy ever tried to do anything remotely along these lines? I mean, the answer is yes. Clearly, for three years during the Spanish Civil War in the Republican part of Spain, particularly Barcelona and Catalonia, but also elsewhere, the economies ran in a way that's very, very similar to the kinds of things we're talking about. Now, there's two, there's two takes on that piece of history. Um, the Stalinist left, which was dominant at the time, would have you believe that the anarchist economies were incredibly incompetent and didn't work because, of course, the only thing they thought worked was central planning Stalin style. So they have written histories that sort of demean the degree, that, that suggest that it was very inefficient. And, of course, the capitalist world you know, has a tremendous amount at stake in trying to convince us that the actual history of workers' councils, consumer councils, and rural communes making their own decisions, you know, that it was an abysmal failure and that therefore nobody in their right mind should ever try it again. 
And one of the wonderful things that the young Noam Chomsky did was write a wonderful essay on the subject saying, when you actually look at the historical evidence, the anarchist economies in the Spanish Civil War during that three-year time period performed remarkably well. That the economic performance of the economy that was running this way in Spain was not the reason they lost, they lost, they, they, they lost the Civil War. But in any case, Unlike market socialism, where you can point to Yugoslavia from 51 to 80, um, unlike centrally planned economies that you can point to either Cuba today or North Korea today or all the historical experience from the Soviet Union, earlier China, etc., no, there's no national economy for decades that is run remotely along these principles. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about the workers' councils. Um, the Neighborhood Consumption Councils, what do they do? The Neighborhood Consumption Councils do two things. One is they simply aggregate consumption requests that comes from sort of families and individuals living in the neighborhood. Um, so I have an effort rating. Maybe in my household there's also a kid who has a consumption allowance appropriate on age and level of education. We have somebody retired. So we essentially have the sort of consumption right, and we are putting a proposal in saying, this is what we want. And the consumption council, my neighborhood consumption council, is the one that receives that. <laughs> they're gonna look, and they're gonna, they're, they're gonna look at the social costs that are available to everybody. I have to talk about the planning procedure to explain where they come from. They're gonna look at the, at, at the proposal that came from my household, They'll have the effort rating and the allowances, and they're going to see this is, this is what you guys say you, that you would like to consume. Well, we can look at the social cost of producing what you've asked for, and we can see whether or not it's higher or lower than what it is that your effort rate warrants. And as long as it, it, it's very similar to you have an income, mechanically you've got an income. Now, what the sources of the income and how much of it you have is very, very different. But you have an income, and you're free to buy what you want as long as it is within your income. Can you borrow? Can you save? Yes, we can talk about that later. There's no reason. You can borrow and save very much the same way you would borrow and save in, a, in, in, in an economy that you're more familiar with. Um, so the Neighborhood Consumption Council takes these, what I call, what we call individual consumption requests and adds them all up. It's going to send them in as part of the Neighborhood Council's proposal in the planning, in the, in the planning procedure. The Neighborhood Consumption Council needs to do one other thing, it needs to do two other things. One is, <clears throat> it needs to decide, do we want to also request for, for, for what an economist would call local public goods? Um, swing sets for the park, new sidewalk, new clinic that we're going to have in our neighborhood, um, improve the park. And if the neighborhood wants to make that part of the Neighborhood Consumption Council request and proposal, then they add that to the aggregation of the individual family's proposals that, 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 that have been approved. And the Neighborhood Consumption Council needs to do one other thing. And this is where this comes in. So these are local neighborhood consumption councils. But you're going to also need to have a federation of all the neighborhoods, like in a ward in a city. You don't have wards. What do you call them here? Yeah. Wards. wards. And then wards comprise maybe a region of the city, and then there's the city as a whole. And the reason for this is that we have public goods that are consumed basically at different levels. A neighborhood park is for the neighborhood. Um, most neighborhoods wouldn't have their own library. It would make sense to have a library in every ward. So that would be the federation that is going to be participating in the planning process. They're, that's who's going to be requesting the, the library. The library for the ward is going to be requested by the Ward Federation of Neighborhood Consumption Councils. I mean, it's sort of standard political science makes sense. There's nothing fancy about it. Um, well, obviously, the neighborhood councils have to send delegates or representatives to the Ward Federation 
to participate in decision makings about, well, do we really want a library now or do we want something else instead? So that's what the federations are about. And if you think about it, there's, there are certain things that, you know, for the city as a whole, the city transportation system, there are certain things that are at the national level. We're on to allocation. The thing I'm starting to describe, the participatory planning process, is not a market system. That's the best known way of coordinating the interrelated activities of producers and consumers. They buy and sell things in markets from one another. There's another well-known way that it can be done. It can be done through what was called central planning, command planning, authoritarian planning, Soviet-style planning, or just communism. <laughs> and then the third alternative is clearly something called democratic planning. And the participatory planning procedure is one of a number of proposals and suggestions about how to engage in democratic planning. And I'll mention a few others. Um, Pat Devine, um, professor emeritus up at uh, Manchester University, um, he also has a very well thought out proposal about how to engage in democratic planning. He calls it negotiated coordination. Um, and it's different from this proposal. And Pat and I have argued about it for years and years and years. And part of just improving the quality of understanding and discussion about if we get the chance, what would we do that's so different from capitalism and how would it work is discussing those different approaches to, well, is it better to do this way or that way? David Laidman, who is the longtime editor of the Marxist journal Science and Society, he also has a proposal about how one should carry out democratic planning. And for the past 20 years, people like David Laidman and Michael Albert and me and Pat Devine and a few other people have been sort of writing articles in journals and commenting on one another's procedures saying, well, this, this seems to us to work better or this seems to you to work better. And we argue and talk about all those things. What we're slowly moving toward is a better understanding of probably what works best and probably what doesn't. But in any case, those are really the three options. And what I'm describing is one version of democratic planning. Sure, we'll just go ahead and describe what the process is. It's the most complicated part to understand because it requires the most economics. But what's very fortunate is in its basic outline, it's very simple and straightforward and easy to understand. Now, why it would all work and turn out the way that, you know, than it would, that's where it gets more complicated. But at least wrapping your mind around what it is that's going on is not that difficult. Step one is that there has to be some sort of agency, and we've called it the Iteration Facilitation Board that announce preliminary estimates of the opportunity costs of using those scarce resources. All that productive commons that belongs to all of us and should benefit all of us to the same extent, all of that, we're distributing user rights over that through the planning procedure. So for a scarce productive resource, there's an opportunity cost of using it. If somebody uses it over here in this workers' council, then it can't be used over there. So there has to be estimate of what does it cost society when we let you use some sort of scarce productive resource. And what does it cost to society? So suppose, suppose a worker council needs an intermediate good that's produced by another workers' council. Tremendous amounts of the inputs that every work process uses are inputs that were produced by some other workplace. Those are called intermediate goods by economists. Well, they also have social opportunity costs of producing them. So the Iteration Facilitation Board announces its preliminary estimates of what the opportunity and social costs are for anything that you might want to consume if you're a neighborhood consumption council or, or consumer or anything that you might want to use as an input. It also announces estimates of the social benefits of any produced goods or services that workers' councils would be proposing to produce as outputs. Now, these estimates are preliminary. Um, before I forget to mention it, 
Um, for years, we have been trying to sort of get grants to do a computer simulation of the planning procedure to just test where it's strong, where it's weak, where it is that problems will arise. Um, and we finally have actually managed to produce a, a prototype of the planning procedure. And one of the things that we wanted to be very sure about was how sensitive is the performance of this whole procedure to the accuracy of initial estimates of opportunity costs and, and, and social costs. If you start out with some really wrong estimates, does this just totally gum up the works? That's basically the problem that we're concerned with. And we are delighted to have discovered that we, have, we, we can generate those as, ran, we, we've been generating those now as random starting estimates and we still get to the same place in the end, which is incredibly encouraging. So you don't need to have accurate initial estimates. The procedure is going to take very, if they're very inaccurate, it will very quickly adjust them when we go through the rounds of the planning procedure so that they become accurate very quickly. But in any case, the procedure is, these are announced. Every participant in the planning process now makes a proposal. And notice what kind of proposal they make, and notice where the meetings take place for these proposals to occur. They make what we call self-activity proposals. The Workers' Council doesn't make a proposal saying, oh, you've showed us the, the social costs and social, the preliminary estimates of social costs, social benefits, and, and opportunity costs, and now we're proposing this is what the plan should be for the economy. No, no. They're just saying, this is what we want to produce. Here's the list of outputs that we would like to produce. And in order to do that, we are asking permission to use these resources and these intermediate goods and this amount of welding labor, et cetera. So they're saying, we want, we're asking for permission to use this part of the productive commons. And if you give us permission to do that, we will then we are now committing that we would provide and produce the following list of outputs. That's what a worker council proposal looks like. Um, this is part of, in our mind, granting an appropriate degree of autonomy to workers in their workplace over what they do. They should be the ones that get to initiate now you should already be sort of thinking, yeah, well, they're going to make these proposals, but when you get these first proposals in, they're not actually, that's, not everybody's going to be able to do what they just proposed. You're exactly right. Now in central planning, even when they did ask for proposals coming from workplaces, at that point in the process, what happened was the central planners looked at it and said, well, that's not going to work. That doesn't work right. And they would then revise and send back revisions. We don't have a central planning board that says no. We don't have a central planning board that revises. The worker councils not only make the initial proposals, they will be the only ones who ever get to revise those proposals that they make. And that's part of what we are, that's part of the attempt to approximate giving them a lot more decision-making authority over what they do. Now, how is it that their choices affect others and where do the others come in? I'm getting to that. So <clears throat> consumer council, the Neighborhood Consumer Council is going to look at all that and they're going to send in a proposal. Um, and their proposal is going to be, here's what all the individual consumption requests in the neighborhood are, here's the local public good request, and that's our proposal. And they have to send one other thing in with it. They have to just take a look at the average effort ratings plus allowances of everybody in the neighborhood, and they have to submit that. So suppose in this neighborhood, the average effort rating plus allowances was, was 5% below the national average. And in another neighborhood, it was 5% above the national average. These are the effort ratings people were getting in their worker council, not in the neighborhood consumption council. And it's the, but in any case, that's part of a neighborhood consumption council proposal. It's that you not only tell us what you want to consume, but you have to tell us what the average effort rating was for members of that neighborhood consumption council. 
Um, <clears throat> now, how are these proposals evaluated? Very, very simply. You take the estimate of the social costs and social benefits, and let's, let's do, the, the, <clears throat> let's do the product, a, a worker council production proposal first. All you have to do is you look at the list of things that they have proposed to produce as outputs. You multiply those items times the estimates of the social benefits. That's the social benefits of what their proposal is. And you want to know what did it cost society to let them do that. You look at everything they asked to use as inputs. And you simply multiply each of those inputs by the estimate of its social cost or its opportunity cost. So you can very quickly, and it's the you, they themselves, the Iteration Facilitation Board, and every other council can do that calculation immediately. Because you, I mean, and we do it in our simulation. So for every proposal that came from a worker's council, you can calculate those outputs. What would be the benefits to society if they did that? The inputs they used. What would be the cost to society if they did that? Now think about it. If the social benefits are greater than the social costs, then all the rest of us are going to be better off if they do what they just asked permission to be allowed to do. And we would be fools not to say, go for it. Yes, thumbs up. So we call it a ratio. We say, look, for every worker council proposal, you can calculate the ratio of the social benefits of their proposal to the social costs of their proposal. As long as that ratio is one or higher, the rest of us are better off if they're allowed to do it than if they weren't allowed to do it. They proposed it. They apparently want to do it. Go for it. On the other hand, if that ratio is below one, then what they're asking permission to do is use resources that belong to all of us in a way where the benefits to society aren't as great as the cost to society. And we call that, well, that's socially irresponsible. That's a, parent, that's a misuse of resources that really don't belong to them any more than they should belong to anybody else. And apparently, apparently they don't know how to use the resources with as effectively from society's point of view, as somebody else does. So we don't want to allocate them there. How do you evaluate a consumption proposal? Well, here's the long list of things they want to consume. What did it cost society? All we have to do is plug in those numbers that we've got, and we look to see what is the, what's, the, what's the social cost to society per member of that neighborhood council of allowing them to consume what they just asked to consume. Well, as long as the effort rating of that neighborhood council is sufficiently high to warrant that, in their case, it's a question of, is their request socially irresponsible, whether they intended it to be or not? Is their request socially irresponsible in the sense that, given the sacrifices they made on average, it's too greedy? So there's an immediate way that when a proposal comes in, it can be evaluated. And so it's easy for, we don't need a central planning agency to be the no-sayer. Somehow, somebody has to be, somebody's got to be the bad guy. Well, in certain anarchist visions, we don't need a bad guy because nobody would ever try to do something that's socially irresponsible. And that's where I would have a long argument with the anarchists. Um, <clears throat> Why do you think that's necessarily the case? Especially if you haven't provided them information so that they would even have any way of knowing whether what they just decided or proposed to do was socially irresponsible. But hopefully you get the general picture here. The procedure allows worker councils and consumer councils to say, this is what we want to do. And then we don't have an external policeman. The no-sayer is, we don't need central planners to be the no-sayer. Basically, all the other councils can very quickly just say yes or no. Because all we care about is that your proposal is socially responsible. If you're a workers' council, we want to be sure that you didn't use scarce productive resources in a way that wasn't as valuable as somebody else could. 
We just want to be sure that that social benefit to social cost ratio is not below one. And for consumer councils, we just want to know you're not being too greedy. Because if we allowed you to be greedy in your consumption, that would basically be unfair to the rest of us. So the idea is if you provide easy, quick ways for everybody, first thing you do is you provide everybody the opportunity to propose their own activities. That's where you get the proper degree of autonomy. And then the degree to which there's a restraint on what people can or can't do or get allowed to do should simply be, was your, was your, what, is what you wanted to do socially responsible, yes or no? And we have easy ways. We're generating a way for that to be very, very easy to determine. Now, why do you have to go through a number of steps? And that's what the, the, the simulation goes through the steps. We well, start out with a preliminary list of prices, and they're, they're off. There's no way of knowing what they are in advance. What the Iteration Facilitation Board is, when those initial proposals come in, it's going to simply add. Do you need a fancy computer? No, you need an abacus. People constantly are asking, oh, well, you can't run an economy like this if it's, unless it's an advanced economy. What about a third world economy? Don't you need fancy computers? No, you don't need fancy computers to multiply. Um, that's what calculating social costs are when you've got a list of items. Um, and you don't need a computer to add up all the requests for shoes or all the requests or all the offers to supply shoes, you just need an abacus. So all the Iteration Facilitation Board does is it adds up in this, first, in this round of proposals that came in, what's the total aggregate supply of everything, what's the total aggregate demand to have everything, and is there excess demand or excess <laughs> supply? And if there's excess demand, you adjust the estimate of the social cost of making it up, and if it's excess supply, you adjust the estimate of the social cost of using it down. And then you ask everybody to submit proposals once again. And you do this until you have what economists call a feasible plan. Now, everybody that has said, I want to do have something, is going to actually have that much being offered by supplied in grand sum total by all the people that are offering to supply it. Um, that's the planning procedure. Notice where meetings do and don't take place. The most common perception of democratic planning is this. Oh, you got workers' councils, you got consumer councils. I guess they send delegates to a meeting to sort of discuss how are we going, what is the plan going to look like? Who's going to do what? making sure that it all fits together so it could actually be carried out. I think that's the most common perception of what people mean by democratic planning. And notice that is not at all what we've proposed. In that procedure, there would be meetings of delegates to hash out a plan with very little information necessary to know, with what they were, know if what they were hashing out made any sense at all. And then maybe those delegates would hash out a plan. They'd probably hash out five or six plans and then put them up to a vote in a referendum type process. I mean, I've talked about this for enough decades to know that that is the most common vision that people have in their mind when you say, I want democratic planning. I don't want markets. I don't want authoritarian planning. And I'll be very honest, I think that would be a nightmare. I think if people tried to do that, they would discover by January 15th of the first year that they had no clue, that it didn't work at all, and that that would be a very dangerous situation to land ourselves in. But this bears no resemblance to that. The councils are making self-activity proposals. So the meetings are within your council. It's part of your workplace job. One of the things you do, one of the tasks that everybody does is they come up with the worker council proposal. And then when it has to be revised, then they go ahead and that's a task that's in your workplace. So the meetings are all in the workplace. There are no meetings between delegates coming from hundreds of thousands and millions of different workplaces and federations to hash out a plan. No, it's not happening that way. Um,
that's essentially telling you what's happening, and it's sort of a way of you seeing, yes, there's some people in the iteration facilitation board, but all they're doing is aggregating the proposals and adjusting the prices. By anar I mean, the, the anarchists are terribly concerned that the iteration facilitation board is a central planning board in disguise that we have labeled it something that seems innocuous, but it's going to take over, and it's going to, in an authoritarian way, it's, and, and what I tell them is, you know what, you see all the people in the picture there in the Iteration Facilitation Board? Erase them and just put in an algorithm. You don't need people there. So if you think those are the people who are going to take over the planning procedure and turn this into the Soviet nightmare, just erase them. They don't need to be there at all. On the other hand, one of the things we're discovering from the simulation experiments is that an algorithm for adjusting the prices, any algorithm you pick, and we're experimenting with more and more algorithms for price adjustment to, what do you want to, what, in a practical sense, what is it you want to do? You want to cut down on the number of times that this process has to go on. So the adjustment mechanism can help you cut down on the iterations. And if you force me to use a rule and engage in no discretion, sort of human discretion, then it's probably going to take longer. But you know, that might be, that, that's certainly something people can decide for themselves. If you, don't want the, if you don't want to run the risk that some human sitting at that table might somehow accumulate power that was inappropriate, well, then you eliminate it, and the price you pay for that caution is probably three extra iterations in the end. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to find out with a simulation. I've already talked about this. Councils vote yes or no, basically on the basis of, I have an easy way to look and see whether other councils' proposals are socially responsible or not. I don't have to waste a lot of time doing it. Now. Will there be cases where a workers' council says, look, you're looking at our proposal, and we know that it looks like the social costs are bigger than the social benefits, and we know, therefore, that you know, just the quick calculation would say it's socially irresponsible, and you're going to turn it down. But the numbers are lying. There's some things that aren't being taken into account. So clearly, you would have to establish some sort of procedure where you could have appeals. But the whole idea is you want to, to make that practical. What you want to do is you want the, the, the huge majority of decisions should be easy and quick. And then, yes, set up some socially expensive in terms of the time and energy that goes into it set up a, an, an appeals procedure because sometimes the numbers will lie and sometimes it actually is something, something that looks like it's socially irresponsible really isn't social. But the, notice that in the appeals procedure, there's a clear agenda for the meeting. Everybody going into the meeting knows, here's what the numbers say. So if you're appealing, you have to explain where and why the numbers are giving us a misimpression that you are doing something or asking permission to do something that's socially irresponsible. So this is a social process. That's important because it's also a learning process. It's a process whereby workers and consumers are essentially learning how it is that what they want to do does or doesn't impact others. The process essentially is teaching you what are the implications of you doing what you do, what are the implications of you doing what you want to do for other people. So it's a social process. There's no central planning board that's presiding over this. Um, you are in a position where you get to propose and revise your own activities. I haven't talked about pollutants. I'll leave that for Q&A. Notice that because the federations participate on exactly the same, the federations participate in the planning process every round in exactly the same way that the individual councils do. 
So you do not have a system that is prioritizing private consumption over public consumption. One of the great liabilities of a market system is that it, tr it, it provides, it privileges private, it makes it much easier for people to express their preferences for private consumption and much more difficult for people to express their preferences for public consumption. There is no bias in this system because at the same time that private requests are going in and being revised, the public requests are going in and being, it's no harder to ask for private consumption than it is to ask for public consumption in this procedure. And that's incredibly important if you want to sort of correct the incredible bias that the market economies you know, have generated in, in terms of, of, of low levels of public consumption. And the website is absolutely marvelous. It takes you in quickly and gives you a quick view and introduction. And then you keep clicking. Anything that you say, well, I'm more interested in that, or I don't understand that, or I'd like to see more on that subject, you can sort of click through. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. And anybody who is in the least bit interested in alternatives to capitalism and this particular idea, um, this is the place to go first and foremost. Thank you. Thank you.